today is hoping you had a very good lunch break and you're ready to uh, resume our conference this afternoon. So the next session that we are starting this afternoon is titled The Place of Civil Society and Non-Governmental Organizations in Promoting the Right to Health of Persons with Disabilities. And moderating this session is Jake Appel, who is the CEO and founder of the Albino Foundation of Nigeria. I'll just read out a brief biography of Jake Appel so that we all familiarize ourselves with who he is. Jake Appel is the CEO or founder of the Albino Foundation Consultant Disability Inclusion and Convener Disability Inclusion Nigeria. He is also currently the team leader of CBM, SIBTAF Vision Project Nigeria, leading a team of eye care specialists to provide treatment for children with albinism, on-site testing, care, and education in nine states. He was previously the project lead for the Disability Rights Fund in Nigeria. He has a natural ability to develop and build strong network support groups and facilitate sustainable advocacy drive in any given cause. He was instrumental in embarking on national policy on albinism and the implementation guidelines, the chairman of the FGN or UNICEF committee on drafting of national policy on albinism and the implementation guidelines. Jake, we welcome you to our conference, um, and I invite you now to please take the floor and moderate the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, I uh, want to start by saying uh, I'm very pleased and thankful to University of Pretoria, um, the uh, the wonderful department and the team uh, in that uh, department and the wisdom in which you have um, uh, practically uh, taken the lead in Africa in uh, ensuring that issues with persons with disability comes to the front burner. Um, with that said, uh, I would like to uh, make a, a little bit of a correction from my profile. Um, uh, I implement the D DRF uh, project. Uh, I don't work for them. Uh, the Albino Foundation implements the DR DRF, which is a disability right fund uh, project. And we still, um, we're still working in that space. Uh, we got the project again uh, the second time uh, and uh, we're implementing on behalf of DRF. Um, but um, let me <clears throat> um, emphasize uh, the issues with persons with disability and the fact that uh, in, in this space, when one person is left behind, others cannot move forward. And so it is important that we give attention to the health and wellness of persons with disability. Um, this afternoon, I will be uh, moderating like uh, the, the um, uh, lady that introduced me on the place of the civil society and non-governmental governmental organization in promoting the rights of health of persons with disability. This is very important because um, access to health uh, has been an, a major issue in Africa for persons with disability. Access to um, drugs and where the drugs are available, most of them in, especially in, in West Africa where I come from, uh, the drugs are not uh, genuine. And so uh, issues like this will be addressed in this session. Without much I do, I'd like to um, introduce our first speaker this afternoon. Um, uh, but before then, let me also say that uh, Gabriel De Barros, I hope I got your um, name right, uh, is 
helping me in this session and will be serving the role of a rapporteur. Our first speaker uh, this afternoon is uh, very well known in the disability space and will be taking us through on making epilepsy a health priority in Africa, a case study of Asatini, Malawi, and Zambia. And that uh, uh, resource person is Action Amos, uh, the Vice President of International Bureau of Epilepsy, uh, Flourish Research Team, University of Edinburgh. Permit me to um, give a brief, just a brief uh, biography of Amos, uh, a very intimidating one, I must say. Uh, Amos is the International Bureau of a Epilepsy Vice President Africa with 26 affiliates in Africa. He's a member of the Pan-Africa Network for Persons with Psychosocial Disability. Uh, he holds a master's degree in leadership and sustainability from UK, uh, a BA in development study from the island and a post a graduate diploma in disability and rehabilitation management. He's attached with uh, University of Edinburgh as a researcher. Action has served in various board as chairperson and member, both locally and internationally. Currently, Action is a board director for African Disability Alliance. He has contributed globally on issues of, ma uh, of mainstreaming and inclusion of persons with disability. Action has proven experience in the area of human rights, policy analysis, research, and technical application in international development action. He has assisted in promoting inclusion in disability risk reduction. Uh, focusing on Southern Africa, currently action is spotlighted uh, initiative as a civil um, society national reference group member. Uh, I mean, with this kind of profile, there is no doubt that this is the right person that have been chosen to do justice to the topic at hand. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on this note, let me wholeheartedly uh, introduce our next uh, speaker to um, take us on the topic that I have just introduced. Uh, at the end of it, I will come back and do a brief, sum a brief summary and then introduce most probably the next speaker and then we'll take question and answer. Please stay with us and listen attentively. Uh, Amos, you have the floor at this time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator for that uh, uh, introduction. Uh, maybe just to add uh, uh, one, uh, I think qualification that is uh, missing on my profile. I'm also a person who has uh, epilepsy for the past uh, 22 years. So the topic that I'm uh, actually discussing now, making epilepsy a health priority in Africa, it's a, it's something that touches my heart, uh, looking at the journey that I've traveled for the past uh, uh, 22 years, despite all the achievements that I've uh, actually uh, achieved. So making epilepsy a health priority, why are we talking about uh, making epilepsy a health uh, priority in Africa? Well, obviously it means that uh, it is not a priority as we speak. It's not been prioritized at, at all. So hence uh, this presentation is going to showcase uh, from three countries what has been happening and uh, why uh, governments are turning a blind eye 
on uh, epilepsy. So we'll be talking about the governments of Malawi, governments of Zambia, and uh, governments uh, of government of uh, Eswatini. Well, um, if I may ask, um, those are in the controls, if I can be allowed uh, to be a co-host so that I can uh, uh, share the screen of my presentation. Thank you. Can you try if you've been assisted? Oh. Okay, so uh, do I get the confirmation that I can share the screen now? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Thank you. Can. Thank you. Are you able to do that because time is of essence? Uh, are you able to do that? Um, yes, I'm actually trying to uh, do that. Hi, Mr. Amos. Is it okay if I can share your uh, the PowerPoint for you? Um, okay, just uh, a, mi a minute. Uh, okay, I think I should be able to do so. Okay. Okay. I hope uh, uh, you're able to see it now. Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you. So, in this uh, presentation that I'm uh, uh, making, as I've already highlighted, we're talking about making epilepsy a health uh, uh, priority. So uh, what uh, is the, the main question is that why is it not uh, a priority? So in this presentation, I'll be uh, covering, uh, in my outline, I'll be covering the global view about epilepsy, the state of uh, epilepsy, uh, in the African region, then I will zero in on the findings uh, on the analysis that we did on the policies in Eswatini, Zambia, and Malawi, then make a conclusion and uh, some uh, recommendations. Uh, to start with, uh, maybe a question, when we talk about uh, epilepsy and its relation to uh, a disability, there's always a question, is epilepsy uh, a disability or is not a disability? Well, people would uh, define it otherwise, but in countries that I'm presenting, epilepsy is regarded as a disability. I know in other countries, they do not regard it as uh, a disability. But uh, what uh, are the number one causes of epilepsy worldwide and uh, accepted? Well, you might have uh, uh, the answer, but the answer given by the World Health Assembly in its uh, report of, on the 68th uh, uh, meeting, uh, World Health Assembly, it uh, indicated that uh, there are five major causes of uh, disability. And uh, it mentioned issues like stroke, migraine, dementia, meningitis, and one of them is uh, epilepsy. So we have those five uh, big causes and epilepsy is one of them. So one would wonder why um, such uh, a big issue like epilepsy that causes uh, disability will be disregarded on the African health uh, agenda. Well, there are several issues that we're going to cover. First, maybe let's uh, look at the current situation as it is in Africa. In most African countries, uh, epilepsy is uh, treated or it falls under the mental health uh, departments of the countries where we're coming from or at times it falls under the non-communicable uh, disease. So what's the situation in those uh, departments where we're coming from? Let's look at the government expenditure. When we did an analysis, we found that 0.1 is uh, the, the amount of all the budgets that are spent on health are spent on mental health. Of that 0.1, we're not so sure how much is spent on epilepsy because our mental health also has got its own priorities. 
this shows uh, totally that uh, there is a total disregard in terms of expenditure that goes under uh, mental health or epilepsy compared to other regions. How about the mental health workforce? Again, we're still struggling to get uh, enough support in terms of uh, workforce that uh, support uh, persons with uh, uh, disabilities, or oh, sorry, persons with uh, epilepsy. We still linger behind when compared uh, to other regions, even those regions that are also still uh, uh, developing. Uh, what about uh, when we look at uh, issues to do with uh, the neurological dis the disorders? We mentioned um, that there are five uh, major causes, and one of them is uh, epilepsy that causes uh, disability. But within the family of uh, neurological disorders, or what you can call neurological uh, disabilities, uh, primary health care and tertiary level, the most commonest uh, disorder at uh, primary health care or a tertiary level, it's uh, epilepsy. And uh, we have about 40 to 60 or 40 to 70 per each 100 uh, persons with uh, epilepsy in, uh, in Africa. So this shows you that uh, it is uh, quite an, an issue when we talk about uh, epilepsy itself. How about the neurological beds? Again, we still suffer. How about uh, neurologists? We do not have enough neurologists even to do uh, minor tests in terms of uh, testing if someone has got uh, uh, epilepsy. When it comes to financing, again, uh, from this chart that you are seeing, you will see that um, financing is uh, very low. I would say in uh, all the budgets that goes to uh, finance epilepsy, we only receive little half percent, I would say, of uh, half percent of the money that goes into mental health support. That shows you the, the challenge that is there. When we talk about non-availability of drugs, that's the main cause. When uh, departments, health departments are making priorities, epilepsy comes at the, at the bottom. But we'll see uh, the reasons as we move on why it is like that. Now I move on to the findings on uh, the analysis that we did within the uh, countries. The first country which we looked at was um, Eswatini. I would say Eswatini is one good country when it comes to supporting persons with um, epilepsy. I would say uh, very good because I'm comparing it to other African countries. Why am I saying that there is good political will? But this political will is at the highest level. You can talk about the king, you can talk about the prince. Actually, the Prince is an ambassador of epilepsy in Africa. He's also a founder of the African Epilepsy Trust Fund, which shows you that he, there is really high political will. In the recent uh, World Health Assembly, which happened last week, the 73rd, it was only Eswatini, the only country that managed to, uh, to, to second, uh, not uh, second, but to sponsor the resolution that was there, which was on global action on epilepsy and other neurological disorders. But now let's uh, go on the ground and see the policies we're talking about. We looked at the National Health Sector Strategy Plan 2, and uh, we were looking from the year 2013 to 2017. And this National Health Strategic Plan, it sets out very good objectives. It has got a very good uh, vision in terms of health for its citizens. We can talk about communicable disease, we can talk about non-communicable disease, it's very good. It influences all the actions uh, of the National Health Plan. It also guides the implementation of the health financing policies within the country. But when we looked at it, it only mentioned once about epilepsy, and it's in a table where it's mentioning it as a non-communicable disease. Other than that, there is no way in the whole document where it talks about epilepsy. It just mentions it as a non communicable disease. So we are talking about a, a health sector strategic plan that drives uh, the whole uh, health story of uh, a, a nation. Secondly, we went on to look at the 
stakeholder engagement plans. So in Eswatini, they have uh, stakeholder engagement plans, whether they want to develop a certain plan or they want to talk about uh, uh, issues. We looked at two of them, the family planning and COVID response plans. In those engagement plans, consultations are done with all relevant uh, stakeholders. Uh, people in villages or wherever they are consulted and it, we, we could see uh, in the documentation that consultations were done. It also classifies the vulnerable and uh, disadvantaged groups. The grouping, which is so marginalized, it's persons with epilepsy. There is no mention at all. So this is uh, Eswatini. Let's uh, move on to uh, Zambia. Zambia, we looked at three uh, instruments. One, the National Health Strategic Plan 2011-2015. We looked at the National Health Policy and also the Non-Communicable uh, Disease Plan or the, the Action Plan. Then we also looked at the mid-term review that uh, they did. So they have a National Health Strategic Plan, which was running 2011-2015. It did not mention anything on epilepsy. We went on to the National Policy of 2012, we saw again another mention that it is a communicable disease and that was the end. No plan, no any other action. When we went to the action plan of the non-communicable disease, which has been drawn out of the police, we found that there isn't any mention of epilepsy. Epilepsy got lost along the way. Actually, in the initial document, the blueprint of the whole nation is not there. It found itself, I don't know how it found itself, in the National Health Plan. We looked at the midterm review of uh, the Zambian National Health Sector Plan. Again, it was uh, silent. Let's uh, move on to uh, Malawi. Malawi is interesting because that's where I come from and uh, uh, that's where I'm supposed to be uh, supported as a person with uh, epilepsy. The Health Sector Strategy Plan of 2017-22, which is currently run running currently or controlling our health sector. It's so silent. There is nothing to do with uh, epilepsy. We have a non communicable plan, uh, which uh, also has a, a, a full department with directors and everyone. Again, we get uh, a, a zero. So what does this tell us? Usually they say, uh, it's better for you to be on uh, a menu card on a table if you are not part of the ingredients that have made that um, meal that has been served. But for epilepsy, even on that menu, we do not exist. I think this tells a story why epilepsy is not a health priority in Africa. We have just sampled three countries and this is again, the same story around uh, the whole of Africa. So what was our conclusion? So there is systematic exclusion of epilepsy from the health agenda. We can talk about uh, other issues, discrimination, stigma, uh, you know, culture, myths and other things, but systematically epilepsy has been excluded. There is also systematic discrimination. How can uh, epilepsy be found in one document and not be found in another? How can it be mentioned and no action be given? They've mentioned diabetes, they've mentioned cancer, hypertension, epilepsy is in between. But when you go down, the other conditions have got action plans, they've got uh, budgets and so forth, but epilepsy uh, does not have. And this is systematic uh, discrimination in the public policies, the legal system and the health service. And the systematic denial by omission in these uh, key uh, legal instruments. And also I can mention that, um, you know, it's uh, actor oriented, the governments themselves are the ones that are denying people uh, the services um, that uh, they require. We also uh, uh, looked at, um, in our conclusions, the exclusion that is happening. What are the other things that are making it not uh, being on a priority? Non-prioritization is zero. They prioritize other conditions at times, uh, they prioritize where there is funding, even funding from donors or, or other stakeholders. There is, there is serious inconsistency in our uh, policies, our legal framework that supports the health system has serious inconsistency. You mentioned in another document, you find it in another document, you don't, they are not talking to each other. And it might apply to other 
different uh, conditions. There is non-inclusive consultation. I gave an example of uh, the engagement stakeholder plans engagement in, in Eswatini. Persons with epilepsy are not consulted. There is no alignment to uh, international uh, commitments or legal instruments that we have ratified. We can talk about the UNCRPD Article 25. We can talk about the Sustainable Development Goals. We can talk about the WHA um, Resolution 6828, which talks about access uh, to health for all the citizens and especially uh, on epilepsy. There is no alignment to those uh, instruments. And also we found that uh, within the countries, again, we have weak voices in terms of advocacy. Those are the things that are making uh, epilepsy not a priority. So what are our recommendations? First, to ensure that there is inclusion, we need prioritization, we need policy consistency, we need inclusive consultation, we need honoring of um, international uh, commitments. And also we need uh, respecting the voices of uh, persons uh, with epilepsy. And what do governments have to do now? Well. There are some recommendations that have just come last week from the WHA World uh, Health Assembly, the 73rd session. Uh, Mr. And in that Mr. Uh, resolution. Hello, Mr. Emos. Uh, yes. Can you do that in three minutes, sir? Sure. I'm just about to wrap. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mm -hmm. So the governments need to work uh, together with other organizations of persons with. Uh, epilepsy to ensure that they develop what we are calling intersectoral national action plans on epilepsy. And these intersectoral will cover all the sectors uh, that are needed to be talking to, uh, to access to health and also to well-being of citizens. We are not just talking about health, we're talking about all other sectors that support health. There's also need for governments to include achievable targets to ensure that we reduce, uh, you know, sudden deaths that happen due to epilepsy. We're not talking about the meats or what, but we are talking about strengthening uh, the health system around patients with uh, epilepsy. And that will also take care of issues to do with uh, addressing access to medication, stigma and uh, discrimination. As I end, I want to leave you with a quote from my mother here in Malawi, yourself, uh, Dr. Excellence, Dr. Joyce Abanda who is a, an ambassador again for epilepsy in Africa. And she mentioned that we need to fight against discrimination of ep and stigma of epilepsy from the highest office to the remotest uh, village. And with that, I say Zikomo, thank you. Tatenda Nyawonga. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amos. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, you, you said quite a lot, and I'm going to try uh, and use the, uh, a minute or two to just uh, summarize uh, what you have said before I bring in the next speaker. And then I uh, think I want to like uh, take on the next speaker and then open up the floor for question and answer collectively. Um, real quick, you said quite a lot. Let me try and unpack uh, some of the things you've said in a, a few minutes. Uh, you started by um, giving us the topic, uh, which is, um, you, you, you did say that um, it's, it's just saying that making uh, epilepsy a, pri a priority is not, is an understatement. It should be a, 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 a priority. Uh, you gave us uh, a global view. Um, you, you gave us, uh, an introduction of your presentation where you talked about, uh, gave us an insight about the global view. And then they did promise us that you are going to give us some recommendation, which you did. Um, uh, you put up the argument uh, of epilepsy and disability and connected uh, how both of them are interrelated. You gave us a causally look at cause or uh, causes of ep epilepsy and uh, you did a, a good job uh, in also presenting to us the various uh, views of uh, African countries and then zero in on the African countries in question. One of the things that you said that is of interest to me was the connection between uh, mental health and epilepsy. And uh, you did a good job, especially when you connected it to 
neuro, uh, neurological uh, disorder and um, mentioned the fact that uh, one of the problem plaguing epilepsy is inadequate funding and inadequate funding has become a, an issue with access to the health of uh, persons with epilepsy. Um, you gave us three countries' um, uh, views, uh, and as, as Watini uh, tend to have your rating in terms of best practice, and the fact that the leadership of that country is also involved in the advocacy and the struggle. You talked about stakeholders, engagement in that country. But then when it came to Zambia, uh, Zambia didn't get much of your endorsement because uh, it was not properly reflected both in their health plan and in their strategic plan. Malawi also got a zero uh, commitment uh, in terms of that. But your conclusion is of interest to me because um, you gave us a systematic exclusion as part of the problem and uh, discrimination, uh, denial, and no legal instrument. Uh, in your recommendation, you persuaded the government and civil society to work together. And of course, um, task uh, government to do everything possible to reduce sudden death uh, 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 of persons with uh, epilepsy. The need to forge against, uh, to <clears throat> the need to fight against discrimination uh, was one of the very memorable quotes from uh, your mom. And that also uh, caught my fancy. Uh, the fact that your mom is also a, an advocate of what has happened to you. So with that said, we wanna thank you for um, your wonderful presentation and, and say to you, please stand by. We'll bring you back uh, to also take question. And I want to say my audience, please write down your question, put Amos name on it. I'm going to just go ahead and introduce the next uh, resource person. And collectively, I will bring everybody together when you give, when you do your question, I will direct it to uh, either Amos or the next set of speakers. The next set of speakers, Foluso uh, Ade Galu. Please, if I uh, modeled your name, correct it when you will speak. Uh, he's a doctoral researcher, Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria. Uh, there, it will be a tag team. He will be presenting with Wilson Machata, uh, who has the LAM uh, candidate. Both of them are uh, work in the same center. Now, uh, in terms of their biography, I will just do a, a quick cheek of uh, their biography and then uh, allow uh, both of them to take the floor and do a better job. Polusho is a doctorate researcher at the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria. He also worked as the associate manager in the litigation and implementation unit of the center. Uh, let me talk about Wilson, Wilson Macharia. Uh, Wilson uh, is a senior graduate assistant as um, at the Stratmore University Law School uh, until January 2020. I hope he was not affected by the pandemic. Uh, he served as a project uh, support officer at the Agency for Disability and Development in Africa for two, for two projects. Um, of course, uh, for want of time, I would stop and uh, during their own presentation, they can talk a little bit about themselves. Permit me to introduce this dual team, Polusho and Wilson, uh, as they take us uh, in a very um, important topic that they have been assigned to, which focuses on the right to health of persons with disability during Kenya and Nigeria universal periodic review 
a case of underrepresentation. This is very important topic. And for because of time, ladies and gentlemen, let me invite my resource person to do justice to the topic at hand. Uh, if you can do that in 20 minutes, uh, uh, because of want of time, and we'll have a few minutes to take question and answer, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much um, uh, for that introduction as well. Uh, my name is Wilson Masharia, and I'll be presenting um, alongside uh, my colleague, Folosho Adegulu. Uh, perhaps I should also mention that I also have a disability, which is a visual impairment. Uh, for the uh, purposes of time, I'll dive right into the presentation, uh, which is about the impact that the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, has had on the right to health of persons with disabilities in Kenya and South Africa. Uh, and, and Nigeria, sorry about that. So um, the first thing uh, is to highlight the right to health for persons with disabilities in the two countries. Um, and both are state parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which uh, re uh, recognizes the right to health on Article 25. So uh, it basically provides about the enjoyment of the highest uh, attainable standards of health without discrimination on the basis of disability. So this should be read together with other international framework on the right to health, which is basically the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights. And then moving on to the country specific laws, uh, article 43 of the Kenyan constitution provides for uh, socioeconomic rights, among them the right to health. Um, and for persons with disabilities, this is buttressed by article uh, section 20 of the Persons with Disabilities Act of 2003, which also enjoins the National Council for Persons with Disabilities to assist um, the national government in implementation, implementing all its programs on health. Uh, moving over to Nigeria, uh, the socioeconomic rights are uh, uh, provided for on uh, chapter two, uh, with the right to health being provided for on Article 17.3b. Uh, at this point, uh, it's very important for me to uh, state that right, socioeconomic rights in Nigeria are not justiciable. This is to mean that uh, one cannot present a matter or institute proceedings before court that the uh, the state has failed to realize or promote the right to health and other socioeconomic rights. This is different from the case of Kenya where they are justiciable, uh, even though subject to a progressive realization, one can present uh, such issues to court. Uh, so recently the uh, Nigerian government also uh, enacted the discrimination against persons with disabilities Disabilities uh, Prohibition Act, which further uh, re recognizes the right to health of persons with disabilities on Article 21. Now, this should also be read in the light of um, uh, the Constitution of Nigeria, which again does not recognize socioeconomic rights as um, justiciable. So, in this regard, uh, the best uh, that one can do as a person with disabilities in, in the event they want to present the matter in court, they have to uh, just present it on the basis of discrimination. So the right has been provided for, uh, the right um, uh, you know, is realized for other persons, but persons with disabilities are finding it a bit more difficult to access this. This shows the imperative of the human rights mechanisms, um, monitoring mechanisms, for instance, the universal periodic review, which Looks might like, be- uh, We're having, hello, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Uh, can um, I, I think we can continue can your presentation. Okay, I think it's the moderator's network. I think you can continue. 
Um, okay, so I, I was just winding up and saying that uh, the fact that uh, this human rights, the right to health, uh, is subjected to uh, progressive realization, the principle, the concept of progressive realization, uh, which is dependent on the availability of resources, and that they are not uh, justiciable in Nigeria, shows the importance of uh, mechanisms such as the UPR. At this point, I'm going to uh, give an opportunity to my colleague to introduce the UPR in general. Thank you very much, Rosen, for the introduction and um, for pointing out the um, importance of the universal periodic review, especially in a country like Nigeria, where the right to health, um, amongst other socioeconomic rights, are generally non-justiciable. So the, the universal periodic review um, is a process of the Human Rights Council that was established in 2006 by resolution, um, by General Assembly resolution of the United Nations. And um, it's basically, it, it's a process through which um, the members of UN, um, UN member states undergo a periodic review of their human rights records. So we might want to ask what is so spectacular about the universal periodic review, because I mean, there are other um, monitoring mechanisms like the state reporting process, the and, um, other mechanisms that are used to monitor international human rights. So one of the striking feature, or probably the most striking and the most interesting feature of the universal periodic review is the ability of this mechanism to attract the attention of states as compared to- I'm very sorry to jump in. Uh, the sign language interpreters are asking if you can slow down your pace, please. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to slow down now. So I was saying um, the most striking feature of the universal periodic review is the ability of the mechanism to attract the attention of states generally, you know, as opposed to other monitoring mechanisms. And um, so a clear example that I will use to demonstrate this is the case of Nigeria. So Nigeria ratified um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability in 2010, and its um, initial periodic report was due for submission in 2012. Um, till date, which is like eight years after, Nigeria is yet to submit a state report to the um, Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. In the same way, um, Nigeria is also yet to submit its state report to the Committee on Economic and Social Cultural Rights since 2000. That's like 20 years ago. So in a way, when you look at it from the international perspective, there's literally um, these two treaties are like the two most important treaties to enforce or bring um, ensure accountability on the part of Nigeria with respect to the right to health of persons with disability. But as you can see, there is a complete disengagement with these processes by Nigeria. In comparison, between 2008, when the UPR started its periodic review till date, Nigeria has undergone three cycles of the UPR um, review. So this shows how the UPR is a very important tool for stakeholders to hold um, um, states accountable. And also um, the last thing that I will say about the importance of the universal periodic review is that one of the objectives of the universal periodic review is to provide technical assistance to states with respect to implementation of recommendations from the UPR. So um, in general studies, one of the factors that have affected the implementation of um, recommendations by state is the lack of capacity. But the UPR has um, established a universal periodic review voluntary trust fund to facilitate the participation of developing countries. And it has also established voluntary fund for financial and technical assistance to help countries to implement recommendations. So this is just to highlight um, the reason why um, the UPR is considered um, by us to be an important um, process that can be used to realize the right to earth of persons with disability. So um, I hope I'm not going too fast. Please, if I'm going too fast, you can just let me know. I'm trying my best to talk at a pace um, that you can catch up with me. So um, with respect to the UPR, it is important um, for the UPR process to actually realize this right. It is important for CSOs to be actively engaged in the UPR process. So there are five major steps for CSOs to participate in the UPR process. The first one is participation in national consultation um, during the preparation of the national report by the state. 
And the second one is to send a report in the form of a stakeholders report. The third one, which I think is very crucial, is to lobby members of the working group of the UPR during the review and the issuance of recommendations. And um, the last, uh, um, the fourth one, sorry, is to address the Human Rights Council during the adoption of the Universal Periodic Review. And the fifth one is to monitor and participate in the implementation of, of the recommendations. So um, from all of these, um, it shows how important the UPR is to the realization of human rights generally, and in, um, with regard to this presentation, in the realization of the right health of persons with disability. So based on this now, uh, we will now proceed to assess the participation um, or engagement of CSOs um, in Nigeria, during Nigeria and Kenya's review um, by the UPR. Thank you very much for Losho uh, for that uh, presentation. So um, I will go straight ahead to uh, the interaction of Kenya with the UPR process. And as Felicia has mentioned, we've had two cycles, one in 2010 and the other one in 2015 that we are focusing in on, on this research. So uh, for the first cycle, that is in 2010, there were a total of 17 reports by civil society of the organizations. Of these 17 reports, there was only one joint submission by disabled persons organizations. So that also so uh, that shows uh, how um, much how limited the participation of uh, organizations of and for persons with disabilities uh, was. And then um, the submissions on the right to health were not provide were, were not um, submitted on on the first periodic report. This shows that um, and 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 I, I mean. Uh, as, as I conclude my observations, I will tell you why this is the case. Um, the closest that we can actually um, see the right to health of persons with disabilities being mentioned is on a submission by the Kenya Stakeholders Coalition, uh, which is convened by the uh, Kenya National Human Rights Commission, where on its submission on the right to health states that um, there are challenges with the physical accessibility uh -huh. I think, uh, is it me having network issue or? Because I can't hear anymore. So that is probably a network issue because we could hear just fine. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Go yes. ahead, guys. Go ahead. Um, you're just about uh, three minutes. Okay, um, thank you very much. So um, on, on the second, so what I meant to say from that point is for you to even find a submission on the right to health of persons with disabilities, you literally had to force issues and talk about physical accessibility, talking about uh, physical accessibility by persons with physical disabilities. On the second periodic review, that was the same case. Um, of the 23 submissions by CSOs, there was only one su joint submission by organizations of persons with albinism. So this one was even focused on one type of disabilities. And, I, and as I conclude my part, I'll give these uh, observations that I identified. The first one is indeed a few uh, organizations participated uh, by presenting joint reports but they did not actively participate in the UPR process because they only submission, they submitted the reports, but did not uh, participate in the uh, uh, drafting of the country report or in presenting their statements in Geneva. And then the second one, uh, which I'll conclude, conclude with, there's also a lack of disability mainstreaming with, uh, or, or, on, uh, by organizations uh, human rights organizations, which are not specifically focused on persons with disabilities, because this would have had more impact if an organization presenting on the right to health or the rights of uh, women, for instance, also touching on the rights of women with disabilities. 
Um, thank you very much, Wilson. <clears throat> so, I mean, I guess time is um, really running fast um, according to the moderator. So I'll just um, quickly, um, I won't really go into a deep analysis of the situation with Nigeria, but I'll just say it's similar to what um, Wilson has said with respect to Kenya. So I will just leave us, I will leave up with this, just so to show how um, the case of underrepresentation of um, arisen with respect to the UPR and the right um, to health of persons with disability. So Kenya, for example, um, has received um, a total of 419 recommendations from its first two UPR cycles, according to our research. And um, none of these recommendations explicitly dealt with um, the right to health of persons Mr. with disability. you're going too fast, sorry. You are very fast. Can you please slow down? <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, Kenya, um, I'm saying we, we are trying to show that um, the right to health of persons with disability has been um, really underrepresented in the <clears throat> two countries um, that we are discussing now. So Kenya, which is the first country, has received um, a total of 419 recommendations in its first two UPR cycles. And um, there is none of these recommendations that explicitly dealt with the right to health of persons with disability. Um, Nigeria is a bit better um, than Kenya. It's a poor scenario, anyways, because um, out of the um, out of a total of three thirty four recommendations that Nigeria has received from its first two cycles, only two recommendations indirectly, not really, really specifically related, um, um, was um, were related to the right to health. Of persons with disability. So this and um, the fact that the recommendations from the working group of the UPR to these two states did not um, really reflect the right to health of persons with disability, despite the, the potentials of the UPR um, to really um, to help in the realization of this right, shows that the UPR has not been utilized well enough to um, ensure the realization of this right. So no. um, Hi, am I too fast? Oh, please go ahead. Okay. So um, in conclusion, what um, we are saying is that um, the input and um, the active engagement, like an all-inclusive engagement of organizations for and um, of persons with disability with the UPR process is very crucial to ensure that um, these rights are realized through the UPR. Because you know, in contrast to the data that we give the other time, when you look at women's rights issues and children's rights issues, these two countries have over 80 recommendations for um, between um, between the two countries. I mean, 80 recommendations for Kenya and 76 recommendations for Nigeria. So this shows that the salience of disability rights issues are not really pronounced in the UPR um, reviews of the two countries. So in order to ensure an all-inclusive engagement with the UPR process by um, organizations for and of um, persons with disability, um, our suggestion is that um, there's the need for, the, for this category of CSOs and also like Wilson has said, for other um, generic CSOs to also mainstream disability rights issues to ensure the salience and importance of this issue. So the first thing is to develop recommendations in, um, in the form of submission. Can of you do statement. that in one minute? Uh, yeah. I want to uh, yeah. conserve time for question and answer. Go ahead. All right. So the first step is to develop recommendations um, in the form of stakeholders reports to, um, to the UPR during the review. And there's also the crucial need for disability rights CSOs and other CSOs that have um, interest in disability rights to ensure that um, they lobby the UPR working group during um, the state review in Geneva to accept their priority recommendations. This will ensure that these recommendations and these issues come out um, strongly in the UPR cycle of, 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 of the respective country. And when this is achieved, there is also the need to monitor the implementation and ensure accountability on the part of the government for the implementation of accepted recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to apologize uh, that in the course of this presentation, I had a problem with my network. Uh, I was actually timed out. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into details of uh, trying to summarize uh, this uh, presentation of these duet uh, individuals. They've done a good job, um, but I must point out 
the various instruments that they pointed out in their presentation, Article 25 of uh, CR instrument in Kenya, the instrument in Nigeria, um, and um, a couple of uh, very important gaps in the instrument were mentioned. Um, I'm not going to go into all of that. They talked about CSO's engagement and the report. I think the area of interest was um, when they mentioned the albinism organization and um, uh, I would have liked to know whether it is ours or any of the uh, uh, countries uh, so that we can ensure that uh, we make amends. Uh, they talk about lack of mainstreaming uh, uh, and talked about the underrepresentation uh, uh, in places like Kenya, uh, gave a thumbs up to Nigeria. Um, I wish we had time to get into details. We have just about four minutes uh, to the end of this session. I'd like to open up the space and take a few questions uh, and then ask the two presenters to provide answers. I think I'll just take uh, two questions from the first presentation, two questions from the second presentation. And I hope the repertoire, because of my short-sightedness, you will help me Um, if you have question for our first presenter action, uh, please uh, show by raising your hands uh, and I will ask you to ask your question or post it on the chat box. If you have a question for uh, the duet of Wilson and correct that question. I think we have a question or comment on the chat box. Uh, my rapporteur, you can help me by reading it uh, because I'm not able to see it because of my sight. Uh, interestingly, both presenters all have one form of uh, disability or the other. That's a very good choice on the part of the university uh, for this resource person. Please, your question. Question or comment? Whoever is at the back end, please, if you find anybody raising their hands, that I'm not able to see it uh, interject and bring the person. Uh, remember, we have just a few minutes, two minutes. Just a comment. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, somebody said he has a comment, right? Go ahead. It, it was just uh, asking. Thank you. Articles will be published and uh, Han Shu Liu wanted to read them. What did go the ahead. Uh, Go ahead, just, just read them. We have, we have a few minutes to go. Thank you very much. I'm Paul Mugambe from Kenya. Uh, I'd like to ask the representatives a question on how we can enable uh, the increase or participation of organization of persons abilities in terms of the URP processes. Secondly, uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that more information is reached out in terms of the rural population, how will they be able to be involved? Because it seems that there is a lot of a gap there. Thank you. Okay, let me ask uh, uh, Polusha and Wilson team to answer that question, please, real quick. Thank you very much, um, moderator. So um, I think I will first just want to yeah, apologize. We're trying to cut it short. Eh? But, yeah. Yes, please I... make, make your answer very short. Okay. okay. Um, so um, the, the uh, Can you yes, me? yes. Can we please? Can, can, I... can you go ahead? Okay. So um, the the um, the active engagement of CSO can be improved um, through um, of disability rights CSOs can actually be improved by participating first of all in the national process of, of the UPR at the national level so that um, disability rights issues can be more pronounced in the national um, in the national report. Then the second one is um, to ensure that there's a coalition of disability rights CSOs that uh, manage to 
go to Geneva during the UPR review, because this is, um, from our finding, a very important stage at which the CSOs can lobby the Human Rights Council Working Group to include these issues in their recommendations. So it's like, it's a question of competing interests. So you really need to be there to lobby the working group so that your issues get into the recommendations. And I think after that, then of course, to monitor the implementation of the recommendations. I think that's the short answer. And if I may quickly um, respond to what the first person yeah. said, yes, we will be publishing the paper, hopefully in the African, um, African Disability, um, African Disability Human Rights Year book. So yes, you will be able to read our paper. Thank you. Okay, hold, hold your thought on that. Thank you very much. Let me bring in Amos to give us a closing thought in uh, 30 seconds. Amos. Uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, just to reemphasize that uh, as uh, disability organizations, as academicians and uh, everyone involved in uh, disability work, uh, please let's uh, also include epilepsy. Uh, this year we'll be celebrating invisible disabilities. Epilepsy is one of them. So we do well to consider it. Thank you so much uh, for including us in this discussion. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank our presenters um, who have done a very good job. Uh, we started with Amos, uh, who gave us an insight on making epilepsy a health uh, priority. And then we went to the Duet uh, presenters, uh, Felicio and Wilson, uh, who gave us insight in the right to health of persons with disability um, using Kenya and Nigeria as a case study. At this point in time, uh, just for us to respect time, I want to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity given to me to moderate this session and to thank my presenters and the audience. Unfortunately, uh, the engagement wasn't that robust because of time, but uh, you will agree with me that the resource persons have done a yeoman job uh, in making their intervention and we have learned quite a lot. Uh, with that, I say Thank you for the opportunity. My name remains Jake Epele. I'm the CEO founder of the Albino Foundation, the convener of disability inclusion in Nigeria. God bless you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Jake, uh, for moderating that session so competently. Um, I'd like to introduce our next session. Um, and the session is titled The Place of Family and Other Caregivers in Promoting the Right to Health of Persons with Disabilities. And moderating this session is Professor Michael Stain, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability in the United States of America. Um, I'd like to just give, read out his bio for a few minutes. Professor Michael Ashley Stein is the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School since 2005. Considered one of the world's leading experts on disability law and policy, Dr. Stein participated in the drafting of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities works with disabled people's organizations and non-governmental organizations around the world, actively consults with governments on their disability laws and policies, advises an array of UN bodies and national human rights institutions, and has brought landmark disability rights litigation globally. Professor Stein has received numerous awards in recognition of his transformative work, including the inaugural Morton E. Rudderman Prize for Inclusion, the inaugural Henry Viscardi Achievement Award, and the ABA Paul G. Hearn Award. His authoritative and pathbreaking scholarship of over 200 publications and nine edited volumes have been published worldwide by leading journals and academic presses and has been supported by fellowships and awards from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Institute on Disability Rehabilitation and Research, amongst others. Dr. Stein teaches at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, Government and Harvard Medical School, 
holds an extraordinary professorship at the University of Pretoria, Faculty of Law's Center for Human Rights, and is a visiting professor at the Free State University of Amsterdam, Faculty of Earth and Life Sciences, Athena Institute. He earned a JD from Harvard Law School, where he became the first known person with a disability to be a member of the Harvard Law Review, and a PhD from Cambridge University, funded by a WM TAP studentship. Professor Stein previously was professor and Cabell professor at William and Mary Law School, taught at New York University and Stanford Law Schools, and was appointed by President Obama to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. Professor Stein, welcome. I'd like to invite you to take the floor now and moderate the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, to the organizers for allowing my participation. It's a great pleasure to be home and to be back in Pretoria. Um, and I'm only sorry that we are not together in person because I would love to interact with everyone. We have three very fine papers this morning on access to health and disability and human rights. Each of these papers will be given 20 minutes to present their findings. Um, when there are three minutes left, three minutes, uh, to each of your time slots, I will wave to you. I will come back on, turn the camera on and wave to you. Uh, when you are out of time, I will interrupt politely uh, and ask that you wrap up within a moment in order that we may have time for everyone to present their marvelous findings. And should we have time afterwards, we could have questions and answers. I will monitor the box, both the chat box uh, and the Q&A box. So beginning, we'll have um, the topic will be convergence of experiences of persons with disabilities and caregivers, perceptions of policymakers and the provisions of the national disability policy, implications for access to health care for persons with disabilities in Aswatini. And Dr. Ketswimi Masuku, would you be kind enough to take the floor and present your, your paper? There you are. <laughs> Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, let me just quickly share my presentation. Um, please let me know if you see my presentation. I'm trying to share. Um, not yet, Dr. Masuku. Sorry, colleagues. Can you see now? No, Mr. Tariro, could I suggest that we make Dr. Masuku a co-host? Then she'll be able to activate the share screen function. Excuse me. Oh. 
Um, there we are. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I am uh, Dr. Ketsue Masubu. I'm a speech language therapist by profession. I currently lecture in the Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology at the University of Edvetas Rand. Um, I completed my PhD with the Center of Augmentative and Alternative Communication at the University of Pretoria in, uh, in April 2020. Uh, I did a PhD study and my PhD study explored the um, access to healthcare for persons with disabilities uh, under the supervision of Dr. Enza Johnson and Prof. Juan Bornman. So today I'm just presenting uh, a portion of the findings from, from my PhD study. Um, today's presentation will just focus on some of the similarities and differences between uh, the policy documents, the provisions of the policy documents, the perceptions of the policy makers who were involved in the development and implementation of the policy uh, disability policy documents, and um, comparing that against the experiences of um, persons with disabilities when they access healthcare services. Uh, I would firstly like to acknowledge the University of Pretoria um, Faculty of Humanities and um, they granted me a humanities postgraduate support fund, which enabled, which contributed to towards the completion of uh, my PhD and the University of uh, Vatvatasrens um, Vice Chancellor's Transformation Award. Dr. Masuku, can I interrupt? My apologies. Yes. We have a request from the sign language interpreters for you to slow down the pace. Okay. Thank you. No, thanks. So a bit of background. So uh, in the year 2012, um, the Kingdom of Eswatini ratified the um, Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The national disability policy was developed in 2013 so as a means of operationalizing the convention. Eswatini subsequently developed the Disability uh, Bill of Rights and the National Disability Plan of Action in 2014 and 2015, respectively. So it is under this backdrop that um, I embarked on a study to explore access to healthcare for persons with disabilities. So um, three data sources were employed to achieve this aim of um, uh, describing access to healthcare for persons with disabilities. The first um, level was at a document level, so a policy review. So specifically, we, um, we analyzed the disability policy, the disability bill of rights, and the disability plan of action. From there, uh, we developed a questionnaire that we then used uh, to conduct in-depth interviews with key informants, so specifically policymakers. So as I mentioned before, these were people that were involved at different levels in the development and the implementation of the, the disability policies. From the two data sources, uh, we then developed a focus group guide that we used to conduct focus groups with three stakeholders. So persons with disabilities, caregivers of persons with disabilities and healthcare professionals. So um, the policy analysis, so which is the first part of the study. Um, so par uh, parallel to that, we, we uh, I developed a, um, an integrated policy analysis framework, which combined the integrated disability policies analysis framework by Walton Kelsey. In, so the policy analysis um, aspect then looked at um, all these four components. 
So at the level of the actors, we looked at um, who was involved in the policy, and what was the representation in terms of stakeholders. We looked at the context uh, within which the policy was made for. We looked at the specific processes that were followed in terms of implementation, um, or in terms of development and implementation of the policy. And then we also looked at the content of the policy. Why we then, why I then brought in the Peters et al. Uh, framework was that we needed um, depth in terms of analyzing the content with specific reference to healthcare to, uh, with specific reference to access to healthcare. So um, the Peters et al. framework po uh, posits that um, access to healthcare should be available, it should be ac uh, acceptable, it sh should be financially accessible, and it should also be geographically accessible. So we appraise the content aspect of the policy in relation to this four dimensions. And with regards to the qualitative data, so the qualitative data that was obtained from the in-depth interviews and the focus groups was analyzed using um, thematic content analysis, but it was mapped back into the integrated uh, disability policy framework. So the framework was used across the three different data sources, even though differently. So what I've done here is I've highlighted some of the findings that um, I, I think are very pertinent to speak to um, in a, with specifically for this presentation. So the first part is the policy promises. So uh, the disability policies um, promise the availability of healthcare services within reach to communities of persons with disabilities by adequately trained professionals. It promised, um, oh, sorry, within the policy specific reference was made to the availability of rehabilitation services, assistive devices, counseling services to families and persons with disabilities and sexual and reproductive health. Services uh, were said uh, to be provided for free at state hospitals and at affordable costs at private healthcare facilities. So the same was the case with assistive devices. The disability policy further promised um, physical communication and information accommodations for persons with disabilities. Specific mention uh, of healthcare professionals and training of healthcare professionals on disability, sign language, and Braille was also made in the policy documents. Policymakers believed that um, strides had been made to ensure that healthcare services were available to persons with disabilities within reach and that these services were provided by trained healthcare professionals. Um, healthcare uh, policymakers, however, acknowledged that this was not consistent for all persons with disabilities and that access challenges still persisted. So although improvements had been made with regards to physical access and training of healthcare professionals on sign language, policymakers recognized that persons with disabilities were still discriminated against and excluded from some, some services, especially sexual and reproductive health. Gaps in health information and services in Braille and sign language were still a challenge. Therefore, uh, policymakers acknowledged gaps that had occurred in uh, the implementation of the policy. Um, specific mention or specific reference was mentioned to policy, uh, political commitment to the process, financial commitment to the process of implementation, and the lack of uh, skills in policy um, implementation. There was also what was also highlighted from policymakers was the fact that uh, the national disability bill had not, had not yet been passed as law. So then it then makes it very difficult for people to be held accountable in cases where there was an infringement on um, disability rights. 
So with regards to the experiences of persons with dis uh, disabilities, so from their own experiences and the perceptions of their caregivers, um, there was clearly um, evidence of the gap in policy implementation that came through in the challenges that were still experienced by persons with disabilities when they were accessing healthcare services. In particular, persons with disabilities still struggle to access healthcare facilities, specifically due to transportation uh, challenges, namely the costs that are related to transportation and negative attitudes of um, public transport drivers. Um, persons with disabilities and their caregivers also lamented the lack of services, specifically rehab services, which were centralized only in referral hospitals, the lack of um, assistive devices, difficulties with the maintenance of assistive devices where assistive devices um, were given. Healthcare services and information was said not to be available in accessible formats for persons with disabilities. They highlighted how this specifically affected their understanding of instructions related to tablet and medicine taking. Um, stigma and uh, discrimination were still rife in communities, which resulted in self-stigma, specifically highlighted by caregivers, where they will try and keep their children away from their communities as a way of protecting them from um, a community that was not very accommodative and uh, accommodative to their needs and accepting um, to their to their children and um, to their families. So given that healthcare professionals themselves um, live within these communities, it was mentioned that they sometimes bring their own these prejudices into the healthcare system and then they for discriminate against persons with disabilities. Persons with disabilities specifically lamented how the, they were discriminated and how they were excluded specifically in health programs, especially related to sexual and reproductive health. What was also concerning was that persons with disabilities were not aware of their rights to healthcare, nor of the existence of the policy documents. So um, persons with disabilities who were aware of the available um, legislator and about their rights were mostly those that were actively involved in disability movements or those who were actively involved um, as stakeholders during the development and the implementation of these policies. There was a clear inconsistency in the allocation of uh, financial assistance from the states, whereby some uh, it's it seemed like um, the financial assistance and with those who did benefit, it was the the it was in the the way in which um, the funds were allocated was inconsistent. For example, one month they would get financial assistance, the next month they would not get financial assistance. So, in some of the recommendations that we have uh, made from the findings from um, the study where, first of all, I think it's very imperative to address stigma and discrimination. I think this can be achieved by developing and implementation disability conscientization programs from a community level. And um, ideally this uh, program should um, include persons with disabilities and um, they should be the driving force behind those programs. Developing and implementing disability conscientization uh, programs, not only at a community level, but at the healthcare level as well. Um, for example, in uh, the hospitals. So I think healthcare professionals need to be trained on disabilities. So communities and healthcare professionals need to be made aware of the rights of persons with disabilities. 
um, they need to be trained on the disability rights and with healthcare professionals specific reference needs to make, be made to the healthcare rights of persons with disabilities. Communities should be educated on disability causes and how they can assist persons with disabilities. Persons without disabilities should be encouraged to spend time with persons with disabilities so they can realize how similar we are. There's a, 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 um, this is a, a concept that I think um, Roy McConkey terms the heart, the heart knowledge, you know, so the more you spend time with persons with disabilities, you actually realize how similar we are. And um, second of all, apart from addressing stigma and discrimination, there needs to be um, a conscious decision to actually address the policy shortfalls here. So um, what we did is we put together a policy brief stipulating some of the strengths and some of the gaps in the policy documents and um, specific reference was made to recommendations of actually passing the national disability rights law as law so that uh, people are actually are held accountable. And I think there is also just a need uh, to for the state to recommit to being deliberate in mobilizing Im implementation initiatives uh, for these policies. Um, also, I think there's a need for intersectoral involvement here. So it's not in, enough to say um, um, healthcare or social development should be the driving forces be, behind access to healthcare, but it really needs to be an intersectoral um, collaboration. And especially considering that access to healthcare uh, for persons with disabilities across the lifespan is a systematic challenge and it is often influenced by social determinants of health. So it therefore becomes imperative um, that our remedial actions to access to healthcare also consider those social determinants. I think um, community-driven projects might just um, help us move just uh, one step further towards achieving our goal. Um, for example, community-based rehab, because uh, um, it kind of interlinks five components, which are representative of different stakeholders. I apologize, and Dr. Kuru, but we are at the end of your time. Could you wrap up and then we'll move on to the other speakers? I apologize for interrupting okay. you. Okay. Um, so uh, we could look at strengthening communica uh, community projects. Uh, which might mitigate some of the challenges, of, as I mentioned, especially related to geography and financial accessibility, and while at the same time improving attitudes of community members towards disability and, um, yeah, towards disability. Uh, here is an example of some of the access to um, um, health guidelines that we developed to conscientize um, healthcare providers, uh, persons with disability and their caregivers on what their policy, the policy is saying is um, it, it is promising for them. And yeah, this is um, the conclusion basically is just to say that the right to access um, healthcare is acknowledged in various um, human rights laws and legislation. And um, human rights is not good if states do not com uh, commit to actually implementing it. And we need um, a certain need to recommit to the process of implementation by addressing some of the gaps that we have highlighted. And uh, I think the National Disability Plan of Action is key to some of the challenges. And um, social uh, policy implementation should be done in the context of social determinants and particular attention should be focused on disability um, conscientization to reduce uh, stigma, discrimination, exclusion, and dismantling of barriers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Masuku. And I, and I know it's very difficult to put all that work into, into a short time period. But thank you for enriching us today. Um, our second speaker today, we, we have a substitution. We will have Fayal Odeni, the advocacy officer from the Kenya Association of the Intellectually Handicapped, who will present unmet health needs among persons with intellectual disabilities and the role of families. Could we ask you kindly to 
present now. Welcome. Yes, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Fayala Chengo Deni um, from Kenya Association of the Intellectually Handicapped, which is a membership based organization focusing on programs that recognize the rights, um, meaningful participation, and full inclusion of persons with intellectual disabilities and their families in all aspects of life. Um, so I'm substituting for my boss and um, I'm supposed to speak about the unmet health needs among persons with intellectual disabilities and the role of families. So when I first heard about that, my first thought was the stigma and discrimination, which comes from usually health practitioners and the use of um, uh, medical model language where the person with disability is the problem which needs to be fixed is the first thing that a family member does here within um, a, a health institution or um, within a hospital. So their perception themselves at the beginning is what they are told and what they are told by um, the experts is that their child will never truly amount to anything that um, they will not be able to learn like the others and a host of other um, various things that family members hear when they go to hospital or when the, the first time that they are told that their child has an intellectual disability not too long ago we used to even use um, mental retardation that quote unquote that word which is extremely painful for for many family members um, but many who don't know that use that very very often and it's because of the first um, impact or the first thing you hear is that negative notion that the person that you are with or that um, you are supporting or you care about um, is uh, 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 like it's something to be fixed, which isn't the case as many of us will know. Um, so an another issue for many family members or for many people with intellectual disabilities would be that therapy is out of reach and usually very expensive for many family members to be able to pay to have um, their family member with intellectual disability get the supports that they would need um, so that they can be able to live life on an equal basis with others. Um, bearing in mind that many people with, and all people with intellectual disabilities learn and everyone has a different way to learn and there are supports and mechanisms that can be put in place for people to be able to learn on an equal basis with others. And it all starts from the very first moment that they know or it is found out that they have an intellectual disability or that they have um, different um, uh, difficulties that they would need or uh, difficulties that they would need to have um, accessible, uh, access to services to be able to um, live a normal daily life. Um, the other thing is the cost of medication, which many family members will tell you they have to buy. And many people with intellectual disability may have or would have um, epilepsy. Um, I have many that I know who have the dual diagnosis where they have epilepsy and intellectual disability. Um, this is someone who um, is diagnosed and told that they, are need, they need to buy drugs on a monthly basis. These are month, uh, drugs that are not well subsidized. So the, the problem begins where the person will keep on having, um, you know, the, the, the they will get on being told that they need to buy drugs. They won't be able to buy drugs. Um, they will have regression. It's a whole cycle. And a person also has intellectual disability. It's, it's really difficult for many family members even to know what to do. The other thing is communication. How do we communicate to family members and to people with intellectual disabilities when they go to hospital? What do, they, what do we tell them? Do we speak over people with intellectual disabilities and speak directly to the family members, which will then empower the family member to feel like they're the ones making decisions for this person. And we need to, right from that stage, because this is the first place any family member may come to know 
more about their child. And this is the first place that they will then need to know that their child is a person first, that they need to respect their child, that their child has thoughts, feelings, emotions, and that there are different ways that can be used to access those emotions and that these tools can be used to do that. And so the family member will be empowered right from the beginning beginning to know that they shouldn't take charge of everything about their, uh, their child's life. Every parent would want to take charge of um, their child's life in a few areas, but um, with disability, it becomes a whole different thing because then this is, um, um, in, in many aspects, it's more about pity and less about the capacity of the person to continue with their life given, you know, a different support and if, if barriers are removed. Um, so there are also um, many issues around sexual and reproductive health rights for people with intellectual disabilities. No one teaches them about their bodies. No one tells them that they are people. No one tells them that they have emotions and feelings and they have vaginas and breasts and that they can, they have um, penises and they can use these and what these are used for. And we find that there are many cases of people with intellectual intellectual disabilities being violated and their bodies are being violated and they're going to court and we find that many of them cannot even be able to say that I was being touched at my breast they will use a term that is usually used as slang maybe like to say oranges like um he touched me in my orange and that can can be negatively used we've had that um, someone may make a statement and that could be negatively used to mean that you do not have capacity. We've seen um, health practitioners, especially when giving an expert opinion in court, a, an expert opinion is given by a, a, a senior health practitioner who in many times, and I've seen these documents myself, they will focus on what the person cannot do. They do not focus on the abilities and the capacities of the people. And so we see that there's a lot of misconception, even among health practitioners who are um, the experts indeed, but then again, the expert is the person themselves and the people who are around them who live everyday life with them and who see things and know things. And so we need to think around that. And, and there's a, a lot of forced sterilization for people with intellectual disabilities. We seem to think like they do not have feelings or do not want to marry. Um, I am a sibling myself. The, the biggest thing that I know um, my sibling would want is to have a spouse. And so this is something that no one can take away from her. And, and so we, um, looking at disability, we need to humanize it more and to, to start seeing people as people. I'm, I still have a lot of points here, but I'm thinking I'm going to go directly to uh, my conclusions because maybe my time will be up soon. Um, I thought about uh, what could be the best ways then to change this situation because sometimes we talk a lot about what's not happening and we miss out on what, what should happen then. So I was thinking around societal awareness programs where I, the previous speaker spoke about this, where um, there, there are trainings for uh, health practitioners, um, for and, and this should be more community based. We should go back to the communities and take services back there. Because another of the challenges that I wanted to mention was that families have to go long distances. Sorry? Fayal, I'm very sorry to interrupt. I'm done. Yeah. Would you mind slowing down for the sign language interpreter so they can keep up, please? Okay, I'm so thank sorry. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so, yes, yeah, societal awareness programs where um, uh, health practitioners may get the training from people with intellectual disabilities themselves from their caregivers and have them also explain because sometimes the issue is communication sometimes the issue is misdiagnosis misdiagnosis because you're not listening to the person you're speaking over the person so can you slow down and see the person just <laughs> like i was slowed down um so and also i was thinking around support groups uh, for families and for self-advocates. Um, this is really important on my end because um, I've seen the, the changes that support groups or self-advocacy groups do to the people themselves. People believe in themselves. People finally, for the first time, have other people telling them their peers and other people telling them that they're people first. 
that they are loved, that they are cherished, that they have a space in the world, that they are talented, that they can do things. And this changes people's perception. So not really kind of segregating a group, but more a person having an escape to somewhere where they can share. And family members, it will help them because uh, many families on the onset and when they're finding out about their child's uh, disability and in, and in this case their intellectual disability the wording and sometimes the way they're told is very derogatory this becomes very problematic for the family because then there's a lot of division many get divorced many uh, many families divorce and and there's a lot of rift and so the mothers are left and they're bitter and they're depressed and they develop psychosocial um, disabilities and things spiral down very very badly and so these are things that can be avoided right from the beginning from how we speak to people when we are telling them about things and how do we see those things ourselves are we prejudiced to begin with um so subsidized medic medicine and uh, medical related support needs because there are so many people with intellectual disabilities who have um many different um so uh, for example many people with intellectual disabilities also have a lot of issues with um, their teeth or with the dental um, structure and things like that uh, there are a lot of um, so so many different um, the eyes um, so they may need speech therapy physical therapy physiotherapy there's a lot of need and and it's not subsidized and it's not affordable and so a child may need all this supports which is our mandate as humans to ensure that you know every other person can access every other thing that we can access even to the detail that they may need to access it in and so even if they may need different a, a child may need all of them they may need physiotherapy speech therapy you know um physical therapy they may need uh, you know they may need everything and you know you need to support that and and ensure that that is enshrined within law and within uh, um, normal workings of of the government and of the health structures. Is it to understand information from the first visit? It's important because the family member themselves may not be able to decipher all of the, those words that you're saying, whether it's you're telling them, you know, you, you may be using a lot of jargon, which is in the medical field. And so you find that that becomes difficult. A family member just becomes bitter because everywhere they go, I had one family member recently tell me that when she went and her son has autism, um, the doctor said that his head is not okay. So what is that? What, what do you expect a family member to do then after hearing that? What are they supposed to say? Are they supposed to love their kid? Are they not supposed to love their kid? So what, what's supposed to happen? Because you're told that this child will not be like the other children. What then happens? Um, and so uh, the other thing, easy to understand information should always be there in the different ways that it comes out in for any different, any diverse person who may come in there to want information. Se section productive health rights workshops for persons with intellectual disabilities and their families. We need for people to understand who they are, um, uh, to understand their bodies, to understand um, I was being given an example um, that there was a, a person with an intellectual disability, a woman who had an STI, um, a sexually transmitted disease infection, and she, she didn't know because she just doesn't know what goes on down there. And it may seem very awkward because you, you, people think, oh yeah, you're supposed to know, but what if you've never known anything? You've, no one has ever taken the time. You've never been seen as someone who can have organs that are functioning. So how would you know, you know, that you have an, a sec, uh, you know, how would you even know if someone is violating you sexually then? Um, training for healthcare practitioners on communication and the support needs. Also human rights based approach to disability, which is so important because that is an element that is missing. And that goes, it cuts across to just all 
disability and all the diversity in there because anyone may go to hospital and you may find the worst reception whereas you're trying to just access healthcare whether it be in any way whether it be mental health or physical health whatever it is um and also um they for healthcare practitioners to understand the communication needs of people with intellectual disability and how that varies um reduce the stigma around this uh, the stigma and discrimination around disability in hospitals also generally make hospitals more physically accessible because um i don't know if we talk much about that hospitals are not accessible um to people and you can't just get in there so how then are you supposed to get any service if you can't just access the building itself um allow for inclusive budgeting that allows families of pe people with intellectual disabilities to access vital health services for people with intellectual disabilities because a family member may have to buy diapers regularly for a much older a person with intellectual disability maybe 10 12 15 years the family member is still buying diapers 15 years on they're still buying drugs they're still taking them for therapy they're still doing it's so much that looking for fair all the time they come from a very uh, um disadvantaged demographic so how are we supporting people to to live or because we've had so many family members you know have depression we have family members who've lost their self advocates especially during this covid time we have lost self advocates because they couldn't access drugs and it's Ms. really difficult Ireland, sorry to interrupt you but okay. could you briefly wrap up so yes i'm on. on my last I point i apologize yeah. okay no problem i'm on my last point um and to finish off um so the healthcare practitioners should treat people with intellectual disabilities as people who just simply have rights and you know and listen to their voices and look for their voices and you know pull out their voices and try to find out what's going on from the people themselves and ensure represent um accurate representation in in case of violation because sometimes we've had people with intellectual disabilities get violated and then a health practitioner is supposed to give an expert opinion in court and they will say that this person is not fit to stand to stand trial and that is the worst representation possible because they are not looking at the capabilities of the person they are looking at the limitations of the person and so if you see people with their limitations you will never see their capabilities and these people lose cases in court simply because they can't express themselves and not because they can't express themselves but because we bar them from expressing themselves so i'm i'm finished and thank you so much for having kai Ms. File, thank you ever so much. And thank you, especially because you came in last minute to substitute for some of our other friends and we appreciate your generosity. Our last presentation will be by Dr. Josephine Mukabera, lecturer, researcher, and acting director at the Center for Gender Studies, University of Rwanda. And she will be speaking on empowering health professionals for quality care of persons with disability in case of Rwandan public and private health caregivers, Dr. Mukabera. Hello. We hear you, Dr. Mukabera. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Josephine Mukabera from the University of Rwanda. I'm lecturing at the Center for Gender Studies and I'm with my colleague, Jen Mutoni, uh, to share with you uh, the uh, experiences of uh, medical professionals in the context uh, of empowerment. So our paper is titled Empowering Health Professionals for Quality Care of Persons with Disability a case of uh, public and the private health caregivers. Uh, so um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, I will talk about 
uh, the study context first, and then I will go back to the rational, uh, the study objectives, uh, the conceptual framework, the methodology, and then the results. So concerning the study context, uh, achieving health lives and the promoting well-being uh, for people of all ages is part of the focus of the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development. So effort to build the capacity necessary to achieve sustainable health conditions through providing quality medical services accessible to the most vulnerable groups are made by social institutions and non-governmental organizations. So in the, this context, quality health care is defined as the extent to which health care services provided to individuals improve the desired health out outcomes. Uh, I'm talking about the care which are uh, respectful of and responsive to patient needs and the values and irrespective of personal characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, geographic location, and the social economic status. So with respect to equity, inclusiveness, and the respect of human rights, the health of vulnerable social groups, such as those having special needs caused by their illnesses, impairment and disabilities need to be given more attention. So since yesterday we have been uh, focusing on impairment, disability, person with disability. So in uh, focusing on empowering health professionals, uh, it's related to giving them required knowledge, skills and a a responsibility through education and professional training and increase their ability to skillfully care for disabled patients and adapt to changes through professional relationship. So ensuring quality health care to people with impairments requires that health professionals know their specific conditions and the needs uh, and are able to communicate with them and we can provide them with effective information and care that respond to their actual headphone condition. Hence, uh, this paper was uh, framed around the capacity building theory, taking into consideration the ability of individuals and organizations to perform function effectively, efficiently, and sustainably. Uh, so uh, with regard to the problem, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights highlights the necessity for every, every human being without a discrimination to enjoy medical care and the necessary social services. So in the same line, the Convention on the Right of Person with Disability affirms that persons with disability have the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability. In Rwanda, the right of persons with disability are protected along with all other Rwandan Rwanda citizens by the 2003 constitution amended in 2015, Article 51, and the national law uh, number 01, 2007, on the protection of persons with disability. Focusing on the health sector, the Rwanda health sector strives to promote the social inclusion of disabled people through removing barriers that prevent them from accessing equality health, uh, health services. So, however, 
uh, in consideration of those uh, uh, instruments, Gwanda policies and strategic plans have not trans translated into available and accessible services in the study conducted by Thomas uh, related to mainstreaming disability in the development in the country of Rwanda, 2005. And in 2014, the National uh, Council for Persons with Disability reported that the Rwandan health system does not seem to meet the needs of persons with disability, which can vary according to the types of impairment or severity of disability. So the Council of Persons with Disability added that many healthcare professionals do not know how to deal with disability, reason why it is not taken into account. There were also limited services for persons with intellectual, mental, and sensory impairments. Uh, in addition, many persons with impairment are usually unable to communicate with sign language specialists who are supposed to help them to explain their conditions to medical staff. And those specialists are also few in Rwanda. So in the context of monitoring the, the close link between the development objectives of providing a equitable and quality of care services and their effective implementation, this paper assessed the extent to which health professionals are empowered to enable them deliver quality care to people with disability in Rwanda. Specifically, the paper assessed the abilities of health professionals and available facilities to address the health needs of people with hearing, visual, and speech impairments. It further explored the challenges experienced by health professionals in providing care to those people and the potential strategies to improve health services provided to this group. Conceptually, uh, we suppose that uh, gaining knowledge through learning, training, and the mentorship and the, the technological based knowledge and even partnership between institutions may improve or increase the knowledge and the skills of uh, medical professionals and uh, even uh, facilitating access to uh, equipment, like uh, for example, the partnership between uh, social institutions uh, that focus, for example, on some uh, materials needed to facilitate a uh, patient with impairment to talk. The partnership may help uh, that access of those facilities. So uh, we've improved the knowledge and access to facilities and the equipment. Medical professionals are able to directly communicate between with disabled people. And uh, also they are able to identify and specify needs of those disabled people and therefore establish a responsive care related to the needs identified. And this will bring to an improved health and well-being of people with impairment. So concerning the research methods, so the approach was the main qualitative appraisal uh, that he seeks to understand the experiences of health professionals in delivering uh, care to people with uh, hearing, visual, and speech impairment. The study provided a lens through which poor or insufficient care to people with disability can be seen as a result of poor 
or insufficient knowledge and skills acquired during the professional development of web professionals or the job training, as well as a lack of necessary equipment and the facilities. Uh, with regard to the sample, so the study uh, was conducted in nine districts of Rwanda, uh, distributed in uh, five provinces and the city of Chigari of Rwanda. So the data was collected from 12 uh, sample, sampled health institutions across the country based on the specific services they offer, as well as their location in the different provinces of Rwanda. And the, the sample size mixed the rural and the urban health institutions, as well as private and the public ones. So data were collected from uh, 26 respondents. So uh, the technique was uh, basically some structured interviews and the, the documentation which consulted the different reports on the condition of uh, cares provided to people with disability. Data analysis methods uh, was the quantitative descriptive tables and the thematic analysis, the qualitative thematic analysis, which align with the result with the objectives. And the, regarding ethical consideration, uh, clearance to conduct uh, field research was approved by Directorate of Research and Innovation at the University of Rwanda. And uh, we also try to uh, to follow the recommended PURP guidelines. So let's briefly talk about uh, the results. The first objective was related to assessing the knowledge and the skills of health professionals with regard to being able to address the needs of people with hearing, visual and speech impairment. So the result of the study showed that 88.5% of the medical staff interviewed had no professional knowledge and skills related to helping people with the above mentioned impairments. Only three doctors among the respondents uh, said they had knowledge and skills respectively on physical therapy management, audiometry and speech therapy. Additionally, 41.1% uh, of respondents underscored the fact that most equipment and the facilities linked to providing services to people with disability are usually quite expensive and not easily affordable to some health services provider. Concerning the available or availability of equipment and facilities, 61.5% of respondents pointed out that their institution had no particular facilities or equipment related to, to speech, visual, hearing empowerment, such as hearing aids, eyeglasses, assistive uh, listening devices, or other materials helping personnel with disabilities. So 23.1% of the respondents acknowledged the availability of wheelchairs, which were for general use, but not specifically for people with disability. With regard to existing partnership that may uh, compensate the gap, 96% of respondents stated that they were not aware of any partnership in the area of disability while only 4% showed that they had established with institution uh, that specialize in health services and care for people with disability. Concerning the challenges faced by health professionals, 80.7 of respondents pointed out that they lack knowledge and skills as well as the training opportunities that would enable them to effectively deliver services to people with disability. A lack of communication skills such as use of sign language 
was highlighted as one of the key barrier to all respondents. A few respondents highlighted the role played by negative mindset of caregivers, which include the stigma by families and the community members, as well as financial constraints. With regard to how the respondent rate their institution's confidence in the skills and the facilities, 57.5% uh, choose the uh, not confident, they don't feel confident. And the 42.5% uh, felt confident despite the obstacles of an available skills, equipment, and the facilities, as earlier explained. The result exhibits no significant differences among the children institution in terms of available expertise in the area of disability, available knowledge, skills in the same area, as well as available facilities and equipment. Whether urban or rural, private or public, the gap identified showed the inability to provide the quality and efficient service and the care was more or less similar across. So uh, basically, it is evident that many Rwandan health professionals lack knowledge, skills, and equipment uh, to be able to provide the quality care to people with visual, hearing, and speech impairment. And this yes. gap yes. is yes. caused yes. by the fact that uh, many uh, are not uh, the many uh, are not related to the disability may not be well mainstreamed in both formal and informal education programs for health professionals as well as other training initiatives in general. So the inability to effectively communicate with patients having visual, hearing, and speech impairment can affect service delivery and the care starting from the reception, consultation down to treatment and the follow-up. So there is a necessity of ensuring uh, training and education about disability for help uh, professionals in order to give them uh, the knowledge necessary uh, to provide the quality service to disabled people. So this finding conform with the idea that one of uh, the barrier that prevents disabled people uh, to access quality care is that health service providers often fail uh, to provide the responsive service to them due to the lack of adequate knowledge, skills, and equipment. Doctor, please so, forgive me, but we're at the end of our time. Could you wrap yes, up? Yes, thank you. As a conclusion, I apologize. A strategic project uh, meant to translate planning into practice need to be implemented by all development practitioners from public and private institutions to civil society organizations that intervene in providing equipment and the capacity building. Prioritization of capacity building for Rwanda medical staff is one uh, of uh, the priority that promotes quality care to people with disability. So a close collaboration between institutions is needed and also providing clinics and the hospital with the necessary equipment. So from the above perspectives, future researchers uh, uh, should explore the successes and challenges of uh, education of people with visual and hearing uh, impairment to understand that teachers and educators are doing to ensure quality education for this group, as well as providing a conducive uh, running environment for them. Social researchers could also conduct studies on initiatives and activities in place, aiming at empowering disabled people, as well as ensuring their social inclusion. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukabera. And we have just a few moments left. And so could I perhaps ask our three speakers very briefly as we end up the session to give us your one recommendation, if you had the magic wand 
and could have one thing make it into reality, could I ask each one of our three speakers to give us one recommendation, their best hope for change. Perhaps Dr. Mukabera, you might start since you were just our last okay. speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sten. Maybe I give the floor to my colleague, Jenny, to give that recommendation. Absolutely. Well, I have not prepared for this uh, question, but all I can say is uh, that it is important to respect each and everyone's rights because we've seen that all human beings are equal. It doesn't matter whether you have an impairment or whether you're able bodied If we decide to observe and respect each other's uh, human rights, then will have an inclusive global community where everyone sees themselves as you know entitled to each and every right whether it's a health right education right so uh, i really think we should uh, try to create an inclusive and uh, human rights uh, respecting uh, global community thank you Thank you. And Ms. Faya, would you like to offer a quick thought? Um, yes, thank you. I agree with the previous speaker. Indeed, we should start seeing everyone as people first and as having rights and as being respectable. And my other one would be community health um, support services, because we don't have much within the communities to help each other. And there's a lot going on um, that needs a lot of support. Thank you, Ms. Fire. And so for, my, for me, it would be community health. Yes, thank you. Thank you ever so much. I apologize. And Dr. Masuku, would you like the last word for this session? Ooh. I think I'm going to um, agree with uh, the previous speaker in terms of um, strengthening our community projects. Um, I think if we strengthen our community projects, there is that possibility of um, moving, not necessarily moving, but um, having healthcare and rehabilitation services within our communities in the form of maybe home visits, training community healthcare workers, families on how to conduct basic rehab, or to even implement home programs between those visits and uh, strengthening community projects will um, to a certain degree mitigate some of the challenges related to geographical financial accessibility while at the same time improving attitudes of our community members towards disabilities and persons with disabilities. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Masuku and thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to the participants. There are so many of you I recognize old friends and new friends. Thank you to the interpreters who have enabled us and facilitated our communication with our brothers and sisters. We are now at the end of the session. Thank you ever so much for attending. God bless, and I look forward to seeing you at another time. Thank you so very much, Professor Stein, for moderating that session. Um, it was indeed a very interesting uh, session. Um, I'd like to introduce us to the final session of the day. Um, and in this, uh, it's a closing session where, which we have dedicated uh, to highlighting some of the work that the Disability Rights Unit at the Center for Human Rights does. So I'd like to um, start off by reminding us of one of the comments that uh, Professor Phil Yoon made uh, on, on day one. Um, when he described the center as a hybrid sort of um, organization that is both an academic department and sort of fu functions as an NGO at the same time. And I think you will uh, notice from the, 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 the presentations that are coming that there is a mixture of academic programs as well as uh, program work that the center, the unit does. So I, was, I would like to start us off uh, by making 
um, a sort of uh, introducing us all to an, a master's degree program that the center offers. Um, trying to share my screen here. Um, I'll be very brief. I'll just be five minutes. I don't know if you can see my screen yet. Okay, please let me know if you can see it or if you can't see it. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the, the master's program is, we offer an LLM as well as an MPhil degree in disability rights in Africa. My slide is not moving. <laughs> okay, so the, the Center for Human Rights in collaboration with the Department of Public Law at the University uh, launched a brand new master's course in disability rights in Africa. So the degree program was launched in December of 2018. And it is actually uh, the first and only master's program focusing specifically on disability rights in the African region particularly from a human rights perspective. The mission of the program is to educate passionate defenders of the right of persons with disabilities with a deep understanding of the rights of persons with disabilities and to challenge discrimination and stigma against persons with disabilities. There are four specific uh, objectives of the program, and these include to equip students with knowledge and understanding on disability rights at the global level, um, that is the CRPD, and at the regional level, on uh, basing on the African Disability Protocol. The second objective is to equip students with knowledge and understanding on the implementation mechanisms and strategies at global and regional level. Thirdly, uh, the, you know, one of the objectives is to promote an understanding of disability rights as a multidisciplinary field of study. And last but not least, to mentor or to develop African disability rights scholars. In terms of the educational approach that we take on the master's program, we adopt a hybrid teaching approach, which comprises of online learning and residential face-to-face uh, weeks that we call block weeks that and these take place here at the University of Pretoria. Each block week is one week long and students are required to attend uh, a total of two block weeks um, per year during the program. And there is a total of four weeks of contact sessions during the course of the master's program. Two contact sessions are in the first year and the last two are in the second year of the master's program. So as I just said, the, the, it takes two years to complete the course. So I will not go very much into course content for the sake of time. But in case, for those of you who might want to know how much time to dedicate to study, um, it is based, the study, the number of hours is based on a concept, concept of notional hours and uh, one credit equals 10 notional hours. So the core modules, uh, carry a weight of 25 credits, which works out to an average of 250 hours of study on each of the core modules. So these, this includes the contact hours per core module that takes place during the block weeks. And it also includes the time spent on, e on e-tivities through our uh, uh, platform, our e-learning platform known as ClickUp. It also includes time spent preparing for assignments, projects, presentations, and other assessments, as well as examinations. So who can apply for this master's program? So as I said, there are two strands. There's the LLM degree, and then there's the MPhil degree. So in the requirements for the LLM degree is one must have an LLB degree honors. And for the LLMPhil degree, the MPhil is open to non-lawyers with at least an honors degree in an academic discipline relevant to disability rights in Africa, 
or any other qualification in an academic discipline relevant to disability rights in Africa that allows admission to a master's program at the institution where the undergraduate qualification was obtained. If that qualification has duration of less than four years, substantial proven practical or professional experience in disability rights in Africa, subject to the discretion of the dean is further required. Applicants, in addition, must have an excellent academic credentials and demonstrate human rights experience or interest. So in terms of the number of students, um, during our 2018 intake, and th these were, this, this was our first cohort of students, um, we actually admitted 10 students. And then for the 2020 intake, where students will begin studies into, uh, into 2021, we uh, took on 15 students. In terms of funding, there are a limited number of scholarships that are available for African citizens and all applicants are required are encouraged to apply for funding at the time of submitting an application for admission. It, I think it's important to highlight as well that for this program, we are not yet taking making an intake on a yearly basis, but we uh, take on new students at the close of a cohort. So our, we are currently taking on students that will start in 2021 and complete in 2022, which means that our next intake will open in 2022 for commencement in 2023. And there's a link there for you. Um, if anybody wants um, to 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 visit our website and and see a little bit more information on the master's program the second um uh, academic program that the center offers is uh, the short course the advanced short course on disability rights in an african context so this takes place on an annual basis in the, the month of march and it runs for a week so as the title suggests, it's an advanced course um, that brings together a number of people from all uh, disciplines. So we admit people from government, policymakers, uh, academics, activists, and they, they come together to Pretoria for a week. Uh, we're not sure what will happen next year with, with COVID, whether it will be online whether it be in person, but the aim is for them to then get an overview of the main issues the, in, um, associated with disability rights. So they get an overview um, and also at an advanced level of the main issues regarding disability rights in an African context. Then the final project that I would like to highlight that the, the unit is also working on is related to the right to access to justice for persons with disabilities. So the unit uh, uh, started last year implementing a number of projects. So this is now our sort of NGO side. We implemented a number of projects on access to justice in three countries, namely South Africa, Zambia and Botswana. Um, and there were two components of this work. The first was access to justice training, where we provided uh, training on access to justice issues for criminal justice personnel. And the second aspect of this work was related to access to justice research. So the research basically sought to um, examine or to find out what barriers what barriers persons with disabilities face um, in accessing the criminal justice system, either as accused persons or as complainants. So currently we have completed the research in Zambia and the report for Zambia has already been, um, it's, it's been written and it's uh, undergoing the review process and very soon it will be in a position for us to be able to share it. 
and we will arrange a, a special event to validate and launch that report in the near future. And if anyone is interested in seeing that report at the end, please do feel free to let us know and we will share the report with you. At this time, I'd like to um, hand over to my colleague, Ms. Sabiha Majid, who is going to speak to you about another aspect of the unit's work. Sabiha, you're welcome. Good afternoon, um, Diana. I actually think that Ida wanted to do the evaluation now, and then I'll speak afterwards. No problem. Don't hear you, Tariro. Tariro, you're on mute. Can you unmute? Hi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. This is Tariro. You get to see the face behind the emails, finally. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we want to do the evaluation forms right now. We are still concluding our session. Mm -hmm. However, we do want to encourage you to complete the evaluation. Mm -hmm. As, um, yeah. as effectively as you can, because we do want to actually use these evaluations. They're very important for us for monitoring and evaluation. Uh, we take them seriously. We actually discuss the results of the evaluation forms. So please do take your time to complete the evaluation forms so that we can have all the information that we do need. Um, Secondly, I'd like to speak to you on the conference. I'll just be a few minutes. Um, thank you once again for joining us for our very first virtual conference. Um, it is now conference number eight, and I can say that we've successfully hosted eight conferences in November, um, hosted by the Center for Human Rights. And I'd like to thank you all as participants, as presenters and moderators for coming through and actually helping us out. The repertoires always do a great job every year. And we also want to thank you. I'd like to thank the team. I don't want to take Katha's job <laughs> as the closing remarks speaker, but I'd, I'd personally like to thank everybody who has played a role, the communications team, the disability rights unit, Absolutely amazing, mm -hmm. amazing work. So would like to thank you once again. And remember that next year we will have our ninth annual conference. And um, the theme will be discussed to you, uh, next year when we do send out the call for papers. So be on the lookout for emails that call on you to submit an article, to submit an abstract so that we can call you to be a presenter at the conference next year. And um, we will definitely look forward to another conference in November. So I encourage all of you to please come and join us, continue to call on others who haven't been able to join us to come and join us next year. Thank you so much. So at this point, I'd like to pass over to Professor Charles Nguyenar. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tariro, for this opportunity to speak about uh, the journal, the uh, Disability Rights Yearbook. Uh, I think in the course of the proceedings, somebody raised the question uh, whether uh, the paper will be published. Uh, so I have good news for you. Uh, which is that if your paper is accepted by the journal, then of course it will be published. But I think the more important part uh, is for me to explain that uh, your uh, contribution uh, at this conference uh, is highly appreciated. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we would ask you to familiarize yourself with the requirements of the uh, African Disability Rights Yearbook, uh, in particular the requirements of Section A, uh, so that you can look at what you have presented at this conference and see how it can be developed uh, into an article. Uh, the process uh, for our journal is the same 
as other journals, which is that uh, you submit uh, an article for us, uh, and then we ask referees to review the article anonymously. We use, or re rather we approach two uh, reviewers who will advise us as the editorial committee as to whether your paper is publishable. Uh, so we don't actually uh, promise you anything uh, at this stage, but to say that uh, if you work very hard uh, in order to meet the expectations of the journal, the chances are that the reviewers will also recommend publication uh, of your article. Uh, what we can do though, and, 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 and Dr. Murungi might want to make a statement or two, uh, we can do what we describe as an internal review of the papers that have been submitted to us so that we can offer some comments that can help you develop in your article uh, into something that is likely to be published. So the, the, the problem with that promise is that uh, it's done on a voluntary basis and we rely on colleagues uh, to be available to do that work. Uh, but if we look at what we have done in the previous years, we can say that if we do, if we have your paper now, uh, we would endeavor to submit it through uh, internal peer review and then give you a feedback, uh, perhaps, not perhaps, but we can aim to do it in the middle of January next year. Uh, and it is it is actually this point that I wanted uh, Dr. Marungi to also comment whether it's realistic uh, for us to make this promise. Uh, Dr. Marungi, do you have a point to make here? Hello, Charles. Um, not quite. I think I will agree with you. Um, even though I would say that if there are delays, we probably should consider February because a majority of us may be off in January. So at least maybe by the end of January, early February. Okay, no, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. So we, we endeavor uh, to give you uh, a feedback at least by the end of February. Uh, and the important deadline to note is the 30th of March, uh, 2021. That is the deadline by which your article uh, should be submitted uh, to us electronically. And Innocentia uh, is our uh, point person when it comes to submission of articles for consideration for publication. So I don't really want to belabor the point except to say that the journal is very easy to find online. It's an open access journal. So you don't really have to pay anything. If you just go to Google, and you, you, you type in the words uh, African Disability Rights Yearbook, it will take you either to the Center for Human Rights or it will take you to the publishers who are the Pretoria University Law Press. Either way, you will be able to familiarize yourself with the submission requirements. The length is anything between six to 10,000, uh, including footnotes. Uh, we do not use a bibliography we only use footnotes. And the style for submission will also be explained uh, in the submission guidelines. So thank you very much. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Sabia, would you like to uh, speak a bit to the repository, please? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for still being here at this late hour. Um, so Raja is basically a repository on disability rights in Africa. And it's actually a first of its kind um, online source for all disability related resources in Africa. So from you know policy documents, legislation, um, 
case law um, shadow report submitted to the CRPD, the CRPD um, concluding observations on a country's reports. So it's a very, very vast um, open access website. And we are actually currently in the process of updating it. And it should be updated within the coming weeks. So yeah, I trust that it would be, you know, really, really, a really, really good source for anyone interested in learning more about disability rights in Africa. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sabia. Um, so I, I wanted to, oh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I wanted to speak to two aspects of our work that I, I hope you can, um, we, you know, you can engage us on and that we would be able to collaborate on. Uh, so um, in March this year, we uh, became part of a, of a group of organizations that uh, were monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on persons with disabilities uh, globally. Uh, we were interested in understanding how the different emergency and other measures that governments were taking around the world um, were impacting on, on the right to health, safety, life of persons with disabilities. Uh, we've concluded that report last month and um, uh, and you, you know, it's available on the website and you'll be able to see uh, the global perspective of it. Um, we're continuing with the research because one of the things we realized through the report was that uh, there were not a, as many responses from Africa, African countries, uh, and particularly Southern African countries. So we had countries like Namibia, Botswana, where, you know, we didn't get any responses. Uh, so in the coming months, we are going to be doing another research that is still looking um, at this area. So if your organization is based in Southern Africa and you are interested in possibly collaborating on this research, uh, please do reach out. We will be heavily relying on local organizations to help us get the data that uh, hopefully you know, informs changes in, in, in policies and practices uh, around these issues. So really appreciate you reaching out to us and we can give you more details on what that uh, collaboration or help looks like to us. Um, we also, as part of our work, focus on the rights of persons with albinism. Um, um, uh, what that looks like is that we, we support the mandate of the UN Independent Experts on Albinism, Ms. Iro. Uh, we also annually host a training for organizations that work to advance uh, the rights of persons with albinism. Uh, the focus of this training is uh, on really building capacity of these organizations to be able to advocate for these rights, not only at a national level, but uh, at a regional and international level. So we, you know, we teach human rights, we teach advocacy skills. So we do publish a call uh, every year for organizations or, or we send out invitations for organizations to join us. So if you would like to, uh, you know, be made aware of that call and you're working in this area, uh, please also write to Tariro and we will add you on the mailing list uh, so that you are made aware of, of this and, uh, other work that we do on albinism. So I, uh, that's it for me. And uh, but you're welcome to email me if you have any specific questions up around those two. Uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Nkata Murungi for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Nasentia, um, and colleagues from the disability rights team. I I will also not be very long um, as as it is. We've already been here for quite some time and it's coming to the end of the day. So I know that everyone probably just wants to close and go. So I'll keep my comments very brief. Um, we've had such a good two days um, in which I think, at least in my opinion, it has been very insightful. And we've discussed a range of issues, you know, ranging from um, you know, of different nature, ranging from uh, access to health in the current COVID-19 uh, climate, philosophical inquiries in some cases, uh, academic explorations, personal experiences. I think this is just uh, to, to list a few, but it has been a very enriching two days. And 
we are coming to the close of the conference and my hope, my very sincere hope is that we are leaving a more informed uh, people and that whatever it is that we have been informed of, we are going to apply in our respective organizations when we go back to work. Um, it's unfortunate that we can we didn't do this uh, conference, you know, in a physical meeting because it's usually very also helpful for us to see who is who uh, and what are they they are doing in their respective countries. But even in this climate, we are really sincerely thankful that we are nevertheless able to successfully host uh, this conference. Just to recall something that Diana has mentioned, and to say that um, as uh, Professor Filion mentioned yesterday, for us as a center, being both academic and a non-government organization, this conference is is, uh, is is the one forum that sort of epitomizes who we are, because we are able to, to bridge academic research with action research, advocacy and uh, practice and experience from implementation. So for us, this is really a, like sort of a flagship project that we do as a Center for Human Rights. And we are too very grateful that you can be a part of this. So since we are coming to the end, mine is uh, really just uh, very simple. It's to share some words of sincere appreciation for your time as the participants and for sharing your views through the chats and through um, the, the plenary in various formats. Um, I would want to take the opportunity to specifically thank a certain, uh, a few people that have made this conference a success. And I think the first, my first uh, point of gratitude is to all the presenters who took time to prepare and to make, uh, to bring their, their, their insights, their knowledge, their skills, their experience to this forum. Thank you very much to each and every one of you from yesterday to through to today. I would also want to say um, a big word of thank you to the moderators who gave us their time um, to help to facilitate and ensure that the conference was interactive and interesting throughout the two days. Uh, thirdly, I would like to thank our rapporteurs. Um, we've had a wonderful team of rapporteurs working behind the scenes. Um, they are drawn from the, they are alumni rather of the Disability Rights Scholarship Program, which we minister and we really very grateful for their time and for their skill in helping us in this, in this regard to have a record of the conference. I would also want to thank the interpreters. They have been very patient with us, uh, some of us, even myself, uh, we've been very fast and in some occasions we have given a very, them a very tough job. Uh, we apologize and we are also noting that this is a learning journey for all of us uh, so that the next time we, uh, those of us who have been speaking in the conference, the next time we speak, we should we'll learn how to pace ourselves better for sign language interpretation. But to our interpreters, we are sincerely grateful. Um, I would want to thank in absentia our Dean who uh, from the faculty side, she's really been a, a strong supporter for the center, but especially also for this conference. Um, we were her first forum when she became Dean last year. And this year we were grateful to see her again, uh, to come and uh, lend um, her support to us. And similarly also to Professor Villun, who is not here, um, just for his support to the team and his uh, leadership generally for us as a center. Um, finally, I just want to come back in-house and say a, a huge thank you to the disability rights team and to our communications team that has made this conference a success. I would start from with the colleagues from the communications team. Asisa Mastel here, Tiruna, uh, Yolanda, Simpiwe, you've been really a huge help from the back and we cannot thank you enough. Um, colleagues from the disability unit, most of whom have already just spoken, uh, Innocentia, Diana, Tariro, Sabia, um, and Professor Charles Gwena, uh, who is always you know, a pillar for us, though in the background most of the time, but we really count on your expertise and we are eternally grateful. And finally, to everyone who really took your time to be with us over two days, we understand that it's not, we don't take it for granted. A lot of people register and don't show up. We sincerely appreciate your time and interest. We are hoping that next year, 
um, that we will have overcome this COVID uh, imposed uh, lifestyle and hopefully we can reconvene in person. Uh, we'll take the lessons we've learned from hosting this virtually as well, but hopefully we see you next year because we, we, we aim to establish a community of practice people who are interested in taking forward the conversation on disability rights on the continent so we truly look forward to hoping that you are you are joining that community and will be a consistent um, participant for our disability conferences uh, we invite you to engage with us through the various platforms that we have shared with you which we have uh, been consistently posting you can find us on facebook you can find us on on linkedin on uh, youtube please engage with us in the various forums. Also, if you go to our website, you'll find our various contacts. You can get in touch with us if you need any form of clarification or further information. We are always looking forward to engage. So from my side, it's really, again, finally, a word of thank you to all of you and wish you well and look forward to seeing you um, hopefully in the near future. We will be sharing the presentations um, and materials from the conversations in the past two days using the emails that you registered with. We sincerely appreciate your time and wish you well. Thank you very much.